This will be a recorded uh, meeting. So let's get started. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys having me here today. Um, again, I am the, the bear biologist for West Virginia. So this is the kind of thing that I really do enjoy talking about. And um, a lot of times um, I have to talk to a much um, different audience. So it's, it's always fun to, uh, to talk to a, an audience that's you know, maybe new to bears, and hopefully I can teach everybody a little something about um, the resource that we have here in West Virginia, because we are talking about our state animal. So um, it's, uh, the bear has got a really interesting story here in West Virginia, and it's, a, it's an animal that's been here forever, and, uh, and hopefully will be here forever, and um, bears are doing very well right now. So back when, when folks first started settling West Virginia bears, um, the records, if you look at some of the historical records, bears were were said to be incredibly abundant across the state. And that, that includes the Ohio River Valley, uh, as well as the Kanawha and Little Kanawha River Valleys, because we were an entirely forested state at that time. So um, as time went on and the state became settled and timber harvest started occurring across the state, we saw the black bear population start to dwindle. And, and part of that was due to, um, of course, like I said, the Bears are a creature of the forest, so the, the foods that they depend on are grown by the trees and the, and the shrubs that, that occur within our forest. So as the land started being cleared for agriculture, um, bears started losing some of the habitat that they, they depended on to, uh, to make their living. So in addition, um, bears were seen as competition by a lot of our early settlers, um, especially if they were grazing livestock within the woods. Um, bears oftentimes will, will prey on livestock. So um, early settlers had a, had a negative attitude towards black bears and oftentimes they were, they were shot, poisoned, killed by one uh, method or another year round. Um, and again, they were, they were considered a, a varmint and something to, something to eliminate um, from the landscape because they were, they were affecting people's livelihoods. Over time, uh, attitudes started to soften towards the black bear. Um, we, uh, we saw in the 30s, um, when the field of wildlife management was first becoming an actual, uh, an actual field of, of study, um, folks started to develop a, a conservation ethic. So um, people's attitudes started to, started to soften and people uh, started to begin to see the, the benefit of having a uh, native species such as the black bear on the landscape. Um, the first protection that the black bear received in West Virginia was in 1935 in the form of a hunting season, although, um, you know, at, at the time, a lot of folks probably did not uh, follow those hunting seasons and our, our uh, law enforcement staff at the time was very small over a, a, a large state. So um, there probably was not a whole lot of protection afforded to the bear from that, um, from that, that law. Um, at that time, um, by the early 1900s, our bears, bear population had been restricted to our Eastern Mountain counties. So what is now Monongahela and George Washington and Jefferson National Forest, those counties were where the bear had you know, basically been pushed back into and was able to still survive due to the fact that the land was, was largely inaccessible. Um, and it became in the early 1900s, it became public land. So folks were no longer living there and, and it, um, it cut down on, on some of the human bear conflict going on. Um, in 1949, uh, we made it mandatory that anyone that harvested a black bear had to report it. So our, it's similar to our current game check system. So even at that point in time, our agency was, was seeing a need to keep an eye on this, on the bear population and see what these trends were in harvest and things that were going on. Um, state residents voted the black bear, the state animal in 1955, but it wasn't until 1969 that the bear was given game animal status. The bounty system was finally discontinued in Pocahontas County and um, really um, true bear protection could, could begin. Um, the, the language for the law that, that we have in our in chapter 20 today um, that governs the legal and illegal methods of harvesting black bear um, was written. It was drafted in 1955, but it took until 1969 before it actually was passed by the legislature. So it, was, it was a long battle to finally get the black bear protected officially within West Virginia. So bears and this there's a and I'll try to try to cover all the, the interesting things here about bear biology. Um, for the most part, bears are solitary, okay? So they, they are not, you don't typically find them in groups unless they're in a, an area that's, that's a concentrated food source at like in the fall when bears are feeding heavily or a sound with cubs. Other than that, bears are by themselves throughout most of the year. One of the interesting things about bears that makes it similar to the weasel family is that they feature delayed implantation. 
Okay, and what that means is that the breeding season is actually in the summertime. So June and July is when bears are mating, but they don't actually give birth to their cubs in a den until January. So once that egg becomes fertilized, it does not implant in the uterus until usually late November, or early December. So that's very similar to our weasel species. They do the same thing. Um, when bears are born, they're very tiny. They're covered in fine felt-like hair. Usually they weigh between 10 and 16 ounces. So you're talking about an animal that weighs less than a pound when it's born in the den and, uh, and to a mother that is, that is hibernating. Um, and then they, they immediately begin um, nursing. And by the time that we actually visit dens in March of the year, um, when they're about you know, one and a half to two months old, they're, they're, they weigh around five pounds, sometimes up to as much as seven pounds. Um, average litter size is typically two to three cubs per litter, but we've had as many as five on several occasions. So um, litters can be, can be quite large. Um, females typically mate for the first time when they're anywhere from three to five years old. And that age at, the, at first reproduction is what is a, one of the key things that determines how fast a black bear population will grow. So uh, males mate for the first time at age two to three, and we typically see a, an increasing litter size with age, of course, up to a, a maximum. What that means basically is that first, first litters are typically smaller than subsequent litters. Um, average Average litter size is 2.7 across all age classes of females. The most common litter size is three. And again, um, I had mentioned earlier, they're solitary except during the breeding season. Um, they feature a polygamous mating system, meaning one male mates with multiple females. Breeding takes place in June and July and they have their, their delayed implanters. So one of the things that um, sets eastern bear populations apart from some of our western bear populations is the fact that females typically breed every other year. In the west, where habitats are not quite as diverse as they are in the east, oftentimes there'll be multiple years between birth cycles. So the fact that females breed every other year is something that helps uh, our, our population growth basically uh, remain at a relatively high level. So if, for example, a female had a litter of cubs in January of 2022, those cubs would stay with her until June, roughly June or July of 2023. So they're with their mothers for about 18 months after they're born. Females are, are very good mothers. Um, typically we see 85% or greater survival for all the cubs to eight to one year of age. So uh, they, are, they are very uh, protective mothers they, and they, they're, they're good at defending those cubs. Um, male juveniles will typically disperse further than the female juveniles. And this is the same thing that we see in most large mammal species the males are typically the dispersers. Um, the females will oftentimes set up home ranges that overlap with their, with their mothers. So, um, you know, oftentimes you'll have related females that are living within the same area. One thing about bears um, is that they are not uh, territorial. So you have um, males and females that are living in the same area, their, their ranges are overlapping and they're not defending an actual territory for themselves. Typically males have larger home ranges than females, about three to five times as large. So a male can have a home range that's anywhere from 20 to 40 square miles, depending on the time of the year and food resources within that, within that home range. Males will move a lot during the breeding season in the, in the spring and summer. And then also we see large, long distance movements in the fall in relation to food availability. Females have much smaller home ranges and typically stay in a, in a much smaller area. But even that smaller area of the females, you know, 10 square miles is 6,400 acres. So that's still a pretty large area of land that that animal is living on. And if you look, you know, the fact that, that males are, are that much larger, um, generally, if you've got, you know, 50 acres, you're the, if you've got a bear coming through, he's just, he or she is just passing through. They're not living just on that 50 acres. This is an actual picture of, of bear locations. These were the different colors on the, on the screen represent, each different color represents a different female black bear. And this is in, uh, Raleigh and Boone counties in southern West Virginia, um, and gives you an idea. Those are um, actually the clusters of points, the two large clusters. Actually, they're all kind of different clusters, but they represent different mine sites in southern West Virginia. So these are these are female black bears that lived on mine properties, um, and you can see they spent a lot of time, or the vast majority of their time, in those areas. So it, it kind of gives you an idea of the the, the size of the females' home range. Bears are, again, uh, a creature of the woods, okay? They're a creature of the forest and they're found most, most commonly in heavily forested areas. And of course, they, they earn their living eating both hard and soft mast crops. So things like acorns, hickory nuts, black cherry, uh, blackberries in the summer. 
pretty much anything you can think about um, plant related, bears will eat on. Even though they're considered carnivores, they are, they are very much omnivorous. So yes, meat will uh, make up part of their diet, both in scavenging and also in, in animals that they kill themselves, but that's, that's not um, what they typically eat. The bulk of their diet is actually um, plant-based. So um, in the fall, like this time of year, starting in, in late August, early September, up until the time that they enter the den, um, bears are really depending on hard mass. So acorns and hickory nuts, beech, um, things like that are what bears are foraging on. And they can be eating up to 20,000 calories a day at this time of year, trying to pack on weight before they go to the den. And again, they'll also move long distances to, to visit these different food sources. So with some of our radio collared males and females, we've had them move over 30 miles in one direction in the fall to different food sources. So, um, which kind of gets you wondering if you have an animal that's been collared, you know, multiple years and all of a sudden you see it move um, a long distance like that, it kind of kind of makes you question, how did they know that food source was there? Because these are straight line movements for the most part. So either at some other point in that bear's life, it had been shown that food source, whether that was by its mother um, or on its own travels um, at some other point in its life, it obviously had located this food source because it knew enough to go there and look uh, for that food source, which is, which is pretty neat. Um, and they also readily take advantage of human food sources, which is why we try to tell people to keep their bird feeders in until later in the year. So typically we're saying people don't put your bird feeders out until December and then take them back down in March um, to avoid these, these problems. Also, uh, we try to tell people to keep their trash contained in a secure container so the bear cannot get into it. Um, cubs are born at a ratio of one to one. So basically one male to one female is how it, how, they, how it evens out over time. Even though some litters will be skewed towards males or females, if you look at a large sample, a large enough sample, typically it's, it's a one to one ratio. Our adult females are our most important population segment because they control population growth. So from a management perspective, when we're talking about setting hunting seasons, uh, we're looking at either increasing uh, mortality rates on the females if we want to decrease our population or lowering uh, harvest rates on females to let our population grow. And that's how we, that those are the key things that we use to, to manage bear populations. And the three things that you know, determine population growth rate of the, of the year are the age that a female first gives birth, that average litter size, and then how, how many years it is between those successive births. Bears, um, the bulk of bear mortality, so bear deaths, the bulk of them are related to humans in one way or another. The largest being hunting, okay, that's, that's the largest number of bear deaths here. I should probably have these switched on, in order on the slide, but also vehicular collisions, poaching to a very small degree, and then also for, for damage situations. The bulk of bear mortalities in a year are due to hunting, which is you know, regulated by us, by the seasons that we set. And again, like I said, vehicular collision. Bears luckily suffer very low natural mortality, typically less than 5% overall. So they, they generally are, and, and they're long-lived species. So we have female bears that live over 30 years sometimes. Um, males typically don't live quite that long. If we see a male that's over 20, that's a pretty old male bear because ma males, of course, they range wider, they get into trouble more, and they're harvested more frequently during the hunting season. So this, this slide actually shows what our bear population, I shouldn't say bear population, this is our bear harvest, but it is a reflection of our bear population over the last roughly 50 years. So in the early 1970s, we estimated our statewide bear population at about 500 animals, and we are somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 today. So the way that we have, We've grown that bear population has been through um, basically research. Um, next year will mark 50 years that we have had radio collars on uh, black bears in West Virginia. Our, our population or our, our uh, sample size has varied greatly over the years. Uh, we don't have nearly as many collared today as we, as we did at one time, um, but we have, we, have, we have learned a lot from our radio collared females. This is a, a, a slide of our, what our nuisance complaints uh, have looked like since 1997 when we started recording them. They vary greatly. Um, nuisance complaints are, are most closely tied with natural food abundance. So in the years of poor uh, natural food abundance, and that's typically in the summer, that's when we see our, our highest spikes in nuisance complaints, 2020 being our worst year um, due to a soft mast failure. And here's, here's how the nuisance complaints kind of shake out by the month. So, you know, we can have, you know, bears are, can be active at any time of the year, even though we say that bears hibernate. Uh, especially in the southern part of the state, we have bears that are coming and going from the dens throughout the winter. So it's not uncommon to be out in the woods in, in January or February 
uh, and to see bear tracks in the snow. Um, because a lot of times bears, if there's food available, will come out and eat a little bit more and then lay down again, depending on how the weather conditions are. Um, but generally, as we're, you know, where we are right now in the year, we're getting into the slow time when it, when it comes to nuisance complaints because bears are kind of winding their year down. Uh, this is, and this is good information here. So when it comes to bear complaints, if you look at our first four categories uh, or five categories on the left, going from left to right, um, garbage by far number one. Um, the, the categories of being seen and around the property typically are tied to things like category number one, which is garbage. Okay, they, they're on the property most of the time because there's a food source, whether that's garbage, pet food, bird food, something of that nature, there's typically something that's drawing that bear in. It's not unusual to see a bear that's just passing through, but if the bear's hanging around, it's because there's, there's probably some food there. And that's, where we, that's how we deal with the bulk of our complaints is um, handling attractants on, on your property, in and around your property. Here's a look, and this is, this is from 2018, it's a couple of years old, but this gives you an idea um, of, the, of where our highest numbers of complaints are. Um, of course, the eastern part of the state, that's where the bears have always been. It's where our bear population grew. So our bear population, as it's grown, has kind of spread southward and to the west. Um, and we have bears clear over to the Ohio River now. Some of our bears have been in Ohio and probably still are. Um, Ohio actually radio collared a bear, uh, two counties into Ohio that in uh, the following June, it ended up in Tucker County. So, and then stayed there. So that particular bear was probably a West Virginia bear. And it was a male that had gone on a, on some sort of dispersal movement, ended up in Ohio and decided to come back. So um, hard to say why, it could have been due to a lack of female bears at that time of year, which is why he came back to West Virginia. This is what the costs of bear damage are. Uh, on a statewide basis around the state. And again, the bulk of these, these claims are, are focused in our Eastern mountains. The counties in red typically are due primarily to corn, uh, field corn damage. So I mentioned that we've had, next year will be 50 years that we've had radio collared bears. We first, radio telemetry just basically um, became something that you could use to follow animals in the late 60s. So in 1972, we collared our first black bears in West Virginia at a point where our population was very small. So the first collared bears, and these were females primarily, were uh, Randolph, Pocahontas, Tucker. Um, those were the areas that we, we knew there were bears, we could catch bears, and that's where we started studying. them. So in 1999, in response to a growing nuisance problem in southern West Virginia, we also added a southern study area. So at one time in the early 2000s there, for about 10 years, we had uh, 30 to 35 uh, female bears in each study area collared that we were tracking um, yearly and doing den visits on. So the way that we, and again, what we were looking for was information on survival and reproduction. So we could look at, we could learn things like um, average litter size, okay? And that's, that's good information to have. One of the key things to um, growing a population though is how many of those cubs actually make it to one year of age to be recruited into the population. And I mentioned earlier, our cub survival is typically 85% or greater. So by following these, you know, by going back to those dens, um, the second winter, basically, when these cubs were a year old, we could look at, we knew how many cubs were born the previous year, then we go to the den the following year and we say, okay, she had three and two of them made it. So we knew, okay, 67% of those cubs have survived. But most of the time, you know, if she had three cubs in one year, she had three cubs with her as yearlings the next year. The other, the other information that we've always collected were our teeth from our harvested bears, and that helps me reconstruct the population through time to develop our population estimates. And we also collect reproductive tracts from the females um, that are harvested during the hunting season, and that tells us how many cubs they would have had the following year. So in the summertime, um, we would be out trapping these bears um, using a variety of methods. Typically, we're using foot snares um, that don't, don't harm the bear. So basically, we catch them in the snare, uh, trying to get a sweet treat out of, the, out of the snare. We immobilize them, we tag them, we put the collars on them, do the things that are necessary that, that, uh, for us to monitor the bear. And then, of course, we go back in the wintertime, locate the dens, and then we do, do den visits on them. So, um, and of course, the most popular den visits are the ones that where the, where the cubs are. The yearling visits aren't, aren't quite as, aren't as uh, um, I guess, desirable from, for some people. Everybody wants to see the little ones. So, uh, and they can be pretty small. The ones in the upper left-hand corner were probably only about uh, two to three weeks old when we visited that particular den. But um, this is always a big hit with, with most folks. So from 1972 to 2007, we handled uh, 
over 1,600 bears more than 4,000 times on those two different study areas. Our average litter size did not differ between the areas, but we did find that our females in the south, on average, give birth for the first time at age three, whereas our eastern Mountain County bears typically give birth for the first time at age four. So if you, from a population growth standpoint, our southern population uh, will grow at a faster rate than our, than our eastern mountain population. Um, I've tried to hit the high spots on the bear stuff. Um, there's a lot more I could probably go on for a lot longer, um, but I'm going to leave it at that for right now and, and try to address any questions that you guys might have. Okay, awesome. So we have a couple of questions here. So are there any electronic tagging slash radio caller methods to map bears in West Virginia? Yes, so um, our original collars were just VHF. Basically, they just gave off a signal that we had to track with an antenna. But of course, as technology has advanced, um, in 2007 was the first year that we had GPS collars available, basically on the market. The, they were the first bears that we radio collared. We've had a number, I guess this were on the third or fourth or fifth different version of GPS collars. So I currently keep about 10 females radio collared in the state. They are, and they are there for surrogates. So when we have orphan cubs in the spring, um, I have these females available that I can take. I can take the orphan cub and I can put it with a, a, a sow that has cubs that year. And we have very good success with those females actually adopting those cubs. So the collars that these bears are wearing now are GPS technology. So basically I can log, log on to the computer and I can see where those bears are on an almost daily basis. So much better than the old technology, but still we have gaps if that, if that bear is not in an area where she is receiving satellite communication. But yes, we do have, and that, that is how we do it now is, is through GPS. Okay. Um, one question that I had was, why do you think the Southern bear populations are giving birth at a younger age than the mountain one? It's, so reprodu every, everything with a bear is dependent, is, is driven by food. And typically it means those females are, are in better physical condition. So that, that is what determines that age at first reproduction is the amount of, amount of food available. So healthier females, heavier females, are going to breed first. So um, it, it has to do with the diversity of our force down here. It could also, part, part of it is probably due to the fact that some of these females down here have access to high quality human food um, mm -hmm. throughout the year, which is part of the reason they're in better physical condition. But it's over the whole landscape, we're talking about a, a forest that is, that is probably more productive. It's more diverse, especially. Uh, so that even in years of food scarcity, these bears down here have other food sources they can switch to. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Hmm, so the next question is, okay, I also want to know this. What's the difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear? <laughs> um, uh, fortunately, a lot. Um, you know, essentially, you know, they're, they're both bears, okay, but um, grizzlies are, are much larger. Um, generally, grizzlies are not uh, tree climbers for the most part. They have large front claws that make them very good at digging, but they, they don't really climb well. Um, you know, the good thing is, the, and then, you know, of course, I don't know, you, you don't, I don't want to assign personality traits to an animal, but um, our, our black bears are, appear to um, get along very well with people around people. You know, 50 years ago, if you look at some of the literature that was available in the early 70s, we thought that bears had to have vast tracts of wilderness area that's undisturbed, with no people around to survive. And that was because at the day, and during that day, that's where the bears were. They were confined to our eastern mountain counties and remote areas. But as we come to learn over time is that bears do incredibly well around people. So um, they're very adaptable, far more adaptable than we are, uh, you know, as far as living in, in urban areas. So, um, and what we find is these bears that live in urban habitats often are much larger. Uh, they have larger litters. Um, and for the most part, you don't even know they're there most of the year, except when they start causing problems. So. When those food sources become limited, that's when we see those bears getting into trouble. And uh, it doesn't take too many bears on the porch, bears tearing up the, the gas grill to get people upset and then want to see something done with that bear. But um, yeah, bears, are, are, our black bears are, are very, very tolerant animals um, and they, they do very well around us. Where, I don't know, I, I'd be a little bit more concerned about a, a grizzly probably you know constantly coming around my house or living around there all the time, but um, I don't know. You know, if we look at the at bear attacks by any species, you know, in, in relation to regular things that happen in life, there's still a lot more things that you are more likely to die from than a bear attack. So, um, 
but yeah, our, for the most part, our black bears seem to be a lot more tolerant of people. Okay. Yeah. And I see that a lot, like back, like I mentioned, I'm from Florida. And so like every other day there was some kind of news casting about like black bears being up in someone's like backyard, like really making a muck. So I, I see that. Okay, so we have a question that just came in. What and where are Black Bear sanctuaries? Yes, I can see the sign on the wall behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that that actually that's a, that's a that's a relic sign there. So uh, we used to have two bear sanctuaries in West Virginia. One was on Spruce Knob, and the other one was the Cranberry West, what you know, the Cranberry Backcountry, the Cranberry Wilderness area. So the Spruce Knob. Um, I want to say it was like 1989 or 90 when we removed that sanctuary. Essentially, those were set aside as bear breeding areas. So you couldn't, you couldn't hunt in those areas at that time. And the idea was throughout the Southeast, sanctuaries had been established to try to provide a sanctuary, you know, an area for bears to basically reproduce. And then as they dispersed, they would help populate the surrounding area. So we removed the one on Spruce Knob first. And it took until I want to say 2002 or 03 is when we removed the protection on the cranberry because we didn't need them anymore, basically. So we have bear season statewide now, and that is our primary tool for managing the bear population. Because as I mentioned earlier, they suffer very low rates of natural mortality. So, and they live very long. So if we have a bear, you know, a bear on the landscape without any, you know, any problems from us, um, is gonna live a very long time. So over time, that bear population gets very large. And then when we do have a mass failure year, we have serious problems. So hunting is our number one management tool for controlling the bear population. And, and we've had over the last, really the last 20 years, we've had some of the most liberal bear hunting seasons in the country. Okay. Another question is, do baby bears have distinct, have a distinct smell like baby puppies, AKA puppy breath? <laughs> um, I've never noticed their breath um, smelling like anything. I. I always think that, you know, when we visit a den, it kind of smells like a dog. I, I, I kind of think it smells like maybe a little bit of a wet dog in there. They're not wet in, in the den or anything, but um, it's, I, I don't know, it's kind of a musty odor. But no, I've never noticed any kind of breath from them, even though I've, you know, so a lot of times when you're holding them, or, you know, we'll have people holding the cubs while we're working on the, on the sow, um, they'll, often, they'll often try to nurse, you know, they'll, they'll be biting an earlobe um, or, or biting your neck, but I've never really noticed any kind of breath. Okay. Another question that I would like to know is, are, is there such thing uh, as brown bears or is that another word for a grizzly bear? Typ typically brown bear is another word for grizzlies. Now there are, you know, in the East, we do not see as many color phase, color phases of the black bear. Although in other parts of the country, we see multiple different colors. So typically in the West, when you get out into Western states like Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, areas like that, you see a lot more chocolate or cinnamon colored bears. So they're not the classic black, black coat color. Um, we also see uh, the Kermode black bear, which is the, you know, they call it the spirit bear or the glacier bear. Um, and they occur, I want to say it's on an island, um, basically islands in the, in the Pacific, the Northeast, Northern Pacific. Um, but they are not, um, but they're, they're, that's an isolated population that's very, very, uh, Un uncommon essentially all all of we've had we've had a handful of cinnamon color phase bears showing up in west virginia typically in the northern part of the state and all of them have been since 2006 but we're talking about four or five animals is all and you think those are animals that have migrated into the area no no definitely not though it's just, it's just a um it's basically a genetic trait so it's just a not not very common genetic trait for color phases in the east okay Cool. Have you ever seen one of these glacier bears? No, only in pictures. Okay. That'd be so cool. I think that is it. Yes. Oh, okay. So I know you mentioned that um, black bears aren't all that territorial, but you know, they're, they do overlap in their range, but they're not quite like, you know, living on top of each other. So how long does it take if say a black bear um, died, how long would it take for another black bear to occupy the space or the range that that previous bear had? <laughs> that, that is a good question. And in order to figure that out, you'd have to have um, a large number of animals collared in one area to see how those how they, those movements play out. Um, 
honestly, I don't think it would take very long. Like I said, because we have such overlapping, they have such overlapping ranges anyway. Um, you know, I don't know. It's that is, that's a that is a good question. Um, but I, I don't think it would take very long because they're all sharing space as it is. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's all the questions. Um, and that's just about the end of the field trip. Thank you so much, Colin, for talking about black bears. I've definitely learned a lot and I hope that everyone watching today learned a lot. Um, there will be a follow-up email with your information as well as some follow-up resources to learn about black bears. Um, and with that being said, I'd like to thank you for being here again and to thank everyone else for watching. Thank you. Bye -bye. <laughs>